Uh, I'm John Letty from Comcast, and uh, I'm right now responsible for network strategy and uh, looking at trends. And we're right now in a in uh, a change. What we're looking at doing to the to the network as a whole, called the smarter network, and then. Uh, you know, as a piece of that, we're we're focusing on V6 technologies and and where we need to take that beyond just uh, V6 uh, as a larger address base. So this this uh, presentation will go into a few of these concepts, and then we'll jump into some segment routing V6 segment routing use cases. So, so no V4. So in this transition, we're looking at getting to a V6 only underlay. Right now, we're targeting about getting about 50% of our current traffic, the total traffic to be IPv6 by the year end. You know, that's outside external traffic as well as traffic generated internally by our own applications. And uh, right now we run about 25 to 30% of our traffic is uh, IPv6 on the network. So we're getting there. Uh, and, you know, uh, just as far as our infrastructure is concerned, our infrastructure is all dual stacked, uh, all the way out to the user, I think about 80%. Plus or minus of our users, you know, have access to V6. Um, uh, if if there's anything, it's it's older CPE prem gear or customer owned interfaces, uh, you know, uh, home gateways and things like that. And that's all rolling off. Um, but we're at the point now where you know we're over the hump of trying to get the infrastructure to actually just support IPv6, and we're starting to look at what can we do now that we've got, you know, IPv6 as an underlay. So if you take a look at, you know, just things we're doing right now, you know, internally, uh, we manage all of our devices with uh, IPv6. So we've got about 40 million devices you know, that, are, uh, that are managed as IPv6 endpoints, and that's growing. The V4 side is, you know, probably, you know, it's a, you know, about 500,000 devices that'll phase out over time. Those are legacy things that are in the plant, and uh, we'll get swapped out. And if you take a look at, you know, on the... Um, CPE and CPE uh, prefix delegation side, you can see us, we've, we're jumping up uh, into that, you know, 20 million, you know, uh, prefix delegated on the high-speed data side of the ne network. So uh, those are all dual stack, but right now we're in the middle of a transition uh, of our X1 video service. So you see, you've seen that in the news, the set-top boxes themselves, they were V4 only devices. Uh, right now we're in the in the midst of a transition of moving them to V6 only devices. So pulling off all of the V4 capabilities, we've done that right now with uh, a good you know, first set of devices. We're about 50% way through the total uh, video service uh, and getting that to a V6 only again. But <clears throat> once that goes to V6 only, I mean, we're making that transition, right? So V4 is not a fallback, you know? So all of a sudden now we're, you know, we're relying on V6 as a primary uh, you know, underlay transport for our flagship, you know, video product. The other thing is it does is it hits the back end of the cloud infrastructure. So once we move, this is very cloud intensive, once we get there, you know, more and more of that cloud infrastructure goes to, you know, has a requirement for V6, but not just that, you know, we can start looking at making the, the cloud infrastructure V6 only. Uh, and then if we do need V4, we do it through a translation or run it in the application layer. Um, what else? If you take a look at like externally, this is one of our large peers that's you know, uh, you know, on the internet side. We're already over fifty percent of our traffic with them. This is probably about a six-month-old slide. So we're more and more growing. You know, with uh, with with these guys. I mean, I'd really consider we we have a you know they're a V6 peer with some legacy V4 traffic, but we're we're over the hump. If you take a look at you know Facebook, uh, you know, same thing. The blue lines the V6 traffic, and we're already. Already um, more V6 than V4. So internally, we're we've got other projects that are already underway. We're moving our voice. You know, we'll move that to a V6 only service. You know, our Wi-Fi hotspots uh, need to be enabled for dual stack for the CPE. But then also, you know, how we transport that back will be all V6 uh, tunneled. And then you know, home security kind of gets us into the IoT space. Uh, so a couple of things just last on, on the V6 front, just so I can convince you that, you know, it's kind of important to us. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity to simplify the infrastructure, you know, and re-architect, redesign how we, 
you know, think about things in the infrastructure. So we're looking at all kinds of things from, you know, how do we redo ZTP for data centers and for other components in the infrastructure, bring it up as V6, you know, start, start looking at things like RAs, not DHCP helpers. You know, we can do Slack, we can get a, you know, globally routable address, we can query backend servers. Uh, we, we use DSCP to now today as a, as a kind of a, as a way to do a little bit of security and a little bit of classification, you know, for treatment of packets in the infrastructure. And, uh, you know, a lot of that was because things like the, you know, the single source or destination of a, of a packet may actually be running multiple services. So you had, you had to classify what the different flows might be, you know, in another mechanism. All of a sudden with V6, we can actually start to break that apart. So we can look at how do we manage, you know, the, how the, the network treatment from, you know, the security from, you know, the address base and start using that. Um, you know, there's any casts seems to be more and more, you know, a, a play in a lot of these, you know, distributed environments. How do we actually start to look at that? I've got a use case on that one. Um, security zones are changing. Um, so we're also looking at things like how do we go to infinite zones? How do we start building closed groups and building policies between, you know, these uh, user definable uh, closed groups? Um, again, commercial overlays. We're looking at IPv4 as a service. So at some point we're going to get to the point where you know you know once we hit 50% v4 may be growing as well as v6 but you know less percent but we're looking at uh, peak v4 so when is the v4 traffic actually stopping to grow as a as a total absolute not just as a percentage and at that point you know we'll look at you know either there or maybe you know sometime in the future I mean, in the past before that uh, we'll um, we'll start looking at v4 as a service and start to Think about it, you know, tunneling everything over V4, using technologies like MAP uh, to, uh, you know, to carry the V4 traffic to the edge of the network. So uh, more and more stuff, uh, IPv6 extension headers, and that gets us into the segment rounding stuff, uh, which we'll cover. So uh, another big piece of this stuff is the transition on the, on the telemetry side. So getting out of SNMP polling and, you know, pulling uh, variables out. Uh, the infrastructure having lots and lots of systems hit it. You know, as part of the simplicity thing, we'd like to be able to pull the necessary information, publish the necessary information, and um, uh, and then have applications access it without touching the actual physical devices in the infrastructure. And you know, when you take a look at like normally in the past, when you saw like a uh, you know, kind of a network management type of a system, it was the thing over on the side that was looking at the network. So what we're trying to do is. You know, the telemetry system is part of the, the actual, um, you know, the, the actual infrastructure components. And, and it's not there to push things into the network. It's actually to reflect the state of the, of the actual physical infrastructure and be there with APIs to be able to answer questions from applications or other you know, devices about something about the network. And we'll get more into that. So on that one, you know, again, it's, uh, you know, it's, I, I like the cartoon because it's, it's, it was a funny cartoon probably from like the, you know, 80s about, you know, you know, publish it, we'll figure out what to do with it. it it's kind of the right answer, though, today. So it's gone from funny to, to true to kind of funny true. So, you know, publish everything, get it into something like Kafka and a pub sub bus, um, and then, you know, allow other things on top to subscribe and, you know, treat it. One, one of the, so, so Kafka is important for us. We're looking at all the different, uh, you know, kind of big data backend platforms. Um, you know, one of the things we're looking at is OpenBMP. We're doing that for kind of the, the uh, uh, path computation kind of backend part, picking up the routing topology and bringing it in, uh, and then providing APIs from there. You know, NetFlow is, you know, important. I think we're not going to get to a clean single thing. We're going to probably have a mix of dealing with multiples of today protocols as we transition to, to new ones. So, Kathy, are you thinking about that on your infrastructure as well, or just servers and things like that? Oh, that? infrastructure. Infrastructure, okay. so like JSON wrap, Kafka type yeah. stuff, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, schemas become more important than actually, you know, right. we may have to mad, you know, right. pull it in from some other mechanism, just wrap it. Right. It. Yes, exactly. Um, I, I ask because, of course, LinkedIn's a huge, huge yeah. Kafka shop. We live on Kafka, so. Yeah, so I mean, we, we see these island efforts, but I think more and more across the board, okay. you know, we'll, we'll go to a single kind of, you know, hub sub kind of model. Kafka is really popular. Okay. 
Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting in this whole piece on the telemetry side, having worked in the networking space for so long, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you know, source A is trying to get to, you know, destination B, and the question is, what path did it take through the network? Right? It's almost impossible to tell. I mean, you get, you know, people that say, well, you know, do a trace route, and then, you know, like, uh -huh. you can't really do a trace route, you know. <laughs> and it's like, well, what we can do is that we can actually, right, yeah. <laughs> we'll simulate the network, and we can do a trace route in the simulation. It's like, well, that's even worse, you know. So, so as far as this open BMP, one of the model, one of the things we want to first have an API to do is say, hey, you know, I'm going to source A, going to B, give me an ordered set of network elements that the path went over. Seems like a pretty simple thing. We should have figured it out a couple of years ago before, you know, before now. But, you know, there is some tricks in this. Like one of the things we need to do, uh, we're kind of on the way, is, you know, getting rid of, multi, you know, of uh, equal cost multi op product, right? Because that's, all that does is it, it just gives you not one answer, right? So you start getting fuzzier and fuzzier. You know, so if there's five different possible paths based on proprietary hashes in the network about where the flow could go or information in the packet that, you know, you don't have access to, it's, you can't define what that path is. So you're talking about on your core getting rid of ECMP? All the way. Just everything. everything. Yeah. So, you know, we'll do equal cost to a neighbor. You know, we might have, you know, we'll have lags. We'll have, we may have to have, you know, equal, uh, you know, equal cost multiple lags. But we're not going to go to two different neighbors. So we'll pull that all back in. It really doesn't provide much value in our infrastructure anyway. We'd rather have the shortest path. You know, fix that path so that we can ask questions like this. So, so the solution, so like Elk and things like that, obviously you've got my attention on this stuff. But um, these are solutions you're going to be providing, or these are APIs you're building into your infrastructure that these solutions can talk to? Both. Both. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's, there's a whole, you know, it, you know, there's a whole bunch of efforts, you know, where people are picking different back-end compute platforms right. and how they're going to format the data. So I think the first thing, though, is, like, how do we get the pub sub thing, right? right. How do we start talking about scares? Yeah. Absolutely. So we're not going to be able to unify on a particular back-end. You know, we're, now we may unify on a back-end for some of the network data. From but the, the application, side. yeah, but the application side and other pieces are going to have different ones just because. So, so you know, um, you know, so one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, hey, if I've got source A going to B uh, and I get, you know, the path, all of a sudden now I can have an interesting use case, which is I've got an application that, that, you know, traps. I've got bad performance. I'm getting bad quality of experience, you know, for something, and it's A and it's going to server B. So now all of a sudden I can take that trap that came in from an application, right, and then I can ask the question of the path computation, and what network elements are involved in this? And it can give me back that node. I can start building a heat map. You know, and so now I've got a chance to, you know, to actually mash, mash up, you know, application data with network data, which is something we haven't had. You know, before. Yeah, do correlation at that point, you can start seeing the trend of what what is inflicting the, right, right. The, the and all all this stuff is like, you know, how do we push, you know, you know, simple simple core? How do we push all of the dynamics, all the complexity to the edge? Whether you know that's a, you know kind of the, you know, f uh, we want to push it out as far as we can, all the way to the app. You know, if we, you know, if that's be at the CPE or something else, you know, we'll we'll do that. But you know, the goal is to get it as far as we can actually to the application. So you know, <clears throat> then we get into this network control versus you know, and that moving into the application from kind of the network. So we're saying, you know, OpenFlow, you know, as an API, you know, we'll use whatever APIs we need. But pushing state into the network is not what we want to do. You know, so you know, we don't want people pushing state. You know, and making mistakes or you know, call it, you know, just blowing up tables. We don't want you know applications pushing state. So it's that you know, getting rid of that dynamic state, no matter how it happens, is really you know kind of key. Uh, and so that's where we're looking at segment routing, especially V6 segment routing. You know, of you know how we program the packets with the state, and we give you know we we allow the application to have some control. So and. You know, people, you know, talk about SDN as a network thing, you know, but really applications have been taking kind of control for quite a while. You know, and you look at, um, you know, CDN. CDNs choose where they're going to deliver the content, you know, into an infrastructure. Um, you know, and they base it on their loads. You know, the user experience would be something. You know, P2P, you know, kind of things have been, you know, doing things like Alpo. And, you know, they've been looking at, you know, uh, you know changing the behavior and how they interface with the network. Uh, and then, you know, even, you know, in some things with, like, video players where they'll pull for multiple CDNs or they can switch, you know, regions and everything. So, 
So this is not new. Um, so, you know, um, you know, on this stuff, segment routing, this was for, you know, somebody, you know, take a look. There's, there's not a whole lot of great information online about this. So uh, I think we're going to try to beef up the online support, give some real use cases. We've been working really closely with, uh, you know, with FDIO uh, on the fast data plane. So the FDI, uh, you now, know. Are you, are you using FDIO on bare metal or are you using it on overlay? <coughs> So we're trying to use it. Uh, we're trying to use that as a building block. So you know, can we actually use it? You know, multiple? on bare metal or just on like NICs on servers? No. So we're trying to use it multiple places. So we'd like to get it into our CPE. We have this thing called RDKB for the home gateway. Right. We'd like to use okay. it there. We'd like to use it as. Uh, so that CPE is going to be DPTK, right? Uh, well, no, depending on you know yeah, whatever no, the is. Okay, right, right. So I'm so, very curious because I'm I'm interested in this whole concept of FDIO for bare metal. So, so, yeah, so we're, we are too. I mean, I think we've got a CPE application. We've got that for Resi, but we also have it for commercial type services. We've got, you know, an OBS replacement opportunity. So we could do it in the cloud oh, environment. Oh, yeah, 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 we, yeah. You know, we can use it as a container function, right? Okay. We can use it as a NFV component itself because it's got a lot of stuff in it. Or we can use it as a bare metal component like you were talking Let's about. Let's take this offline. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well. Okay, so you, <laughs> yeah. so here's like starting to get into some use cases with V6SR. <laughs> so, you know, I actually usually drag this out into multiple slides of varying degrees of, you know, the same information presented. But, you know, if you want to build a disjoint, a policy path, traffic, you know, traffic engineer path, other types of paths, you know, it's pretty much the same use, use case, right? You can just shift, you know, probably the API is what you need, to, you know, is going to shift, not the answer or how you implement underneath. So, you know, you've got a flow going from source colon colon one to destination colon colon one. You, uh, that's, you can query the path computation engine. You get it back a list of here's the network elements it's going through. You say, hey, I want a, you know, I want a low latency path. That may not be the shortest path. Okay. You give me back a, go ahead. Sorry. I'm going back to the elk thing. So obviously you're talking elk. You're bringing log stash, some processing and things mm -hmm. in there. Not only just to Turn the data, but now that I've got the, I've, I've got a good sense of what my events are coming in, what that data looks like. Being able to use like Logstash or some other processor to send those APIs real time. When I see something, send it, trigger it over here, and set a new tag or whatever you want to do. Are you seeing that as a use case, or because I know you said don't programmatic, programmatically make changes. <laughs> Which to me, that means you're just looking at it from an analytical view. Uh, well, so I, what I have been addressing is how this thing, you know, detects. Just, just works you know, it, Right, but I mean, it would be almost like, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that are like controllers. Right? Yeah, like yeah. a content router is almost right. like a controller for CDN. You know, where you request and you get back, hey, you get a 302 redirect, maybe you get a little cookie, and you get putting it to a, to a uh, edge cache, right? So similar things can work for all of these. You events. see where I'm going, right? I yeah. mean, because if I see something... Whatever the event is that I see that's coming into my either Kafka or, or mm -hmm. into uh, Kibana, Elk Stack, yep. whatever, coming in, and, and I know that if I see this event, yep. I want to do this. Yes. And I want to make this change and it's on be my real, network. Right. And it's got to be real time. And it has to be real time. Now, the question is, do you make it in the network or do you make it in the application? And see, that's where I'm going to hang up, is, yeah. is, the, is the application, are all the applications being developed already have... Segment routing capabilities being built in, meaning no. Yeah. See, that's where right. I'm, I'm. I'm. I keep hearing application, application. And I'm in my head. I'm like, okay. So what are these applications? Right. Are they being written? Are they being? So we're we're just starting down that path. Okay. okay. So that's fair. so if you look at this one, this is like the TE example, right? right? So it's you know PEs, and you know you're gonna right. you know pick a path that's not the SPF path, or you want a disjoint path. You know how you switch, what you know, uh, you know OEM you use, and when you flip over to the other, or when you go back and query and get another path. You know those are all you know triggerable depending on what this you know what this service is trying to implement, right? But really, until the applications truly start supporting this, I need to start looking at a way okay. to... I, I, think that, I think it's going to be... I think you're going to have sets of applications that use some generic mechanisms, right. not one mechanism. Sure. Right. That's good. Yeah, and, and you know, so, so in this case, like, you know, you may have a... You know, if you take, like, an application specifically, I may have, like, regulatory issues. I've got to use that red link. 
you know, and I can't push the traffic over some other link. You know, so all of a sudden, you know, I'll get back a, an SRH header where it says, you know, here's the S, you know, the SPF path, great, you know, but it, you know, it doesn't meet my policy, so I need to get a path, you know, to D that uses that red link or that has, you know, the, the correct policy, you know, uh, you know, specified. So you do something like, you know, sources S colon colon one, destination D colon colon one, but I want you to go to A colon colon one first, then I want you to go to B colon colon two, and then, you know, then finally D colon colon one. And so now I've pinned the path or I've pushed the path over, you know, built those three segments. So to me, this, this feels like smarter, like anyone who's ever done policy routing on any platform ever in the history of the world hates it. Right, because policy routing is, it's clunky. But when you're able to say, take some analytics, uh, for example, um, what, you know, regulatory path, or if you know your you have multiple paths the same to the same destinations, one of them is more saturated during peak times because let's say it's Netflix or it's whatever video streaming, it could be internal. It doesn't matter, right? That doesn't necessarily care about something like. Uh, latency because it's one it's mostly unidirectional so you can say I'm gonna create this stack of devices to send this chunk of traffic this way so you've essentially created a much easier to manage policy route based on your existing criteria that you've accumulated from all these different sources right yeah and and you know you know it's not you know it's not like a strict policy hop by hop route right because if that Link, you know, from S to A dies. It'll reroute around, right? right? You know, so it's not a strict, you know, uh, disjoint path. It'll, it'll still diverge. You can still play games like A colon colon one and B colon colon two. It could be any cast type things, or they could be replicated on multiple routers. You know, if they have the same policy links. So you're, you know, but I, you know, I think there's a lot of stuff. But the basic is just, you know, hey, I get to specify a couple of hops in a path that right. determine whatever, you know, you know, I'm trying to express. Right. So, so here we start getting into some interesting use cases. Right? So one of the things we'd like to get rid of in our infrastructure is multicast. We ran WAN multicast. <laughs> we just want to get it off. Right? So we have right now we run a pretty big national V4 multicast network. And uh, we run a lot of video on it. Uh, there's a book, you know, it's, you know, you know, it's vendor interoperability testing, uh, just how applications perform over it. You know, trying, I mean, it's got, the, you know, it expects no loss, and oh, by the way, it really means no loss, right? So it's a very difficult uh, infrastructure component. And if you looked at, you said, "Hey, listen, is there something that makes sense to virtualize given our new, you know, capability? You know, that has a very complex control plane. You know, not very heavy, you know, uh, load as far as forwarding. Multicast is it? I think we run, you know, maybe 10 gig of multicast on a, you know, on a, you know, on a, you know, kind of multi terabit kind of infrastructure. We already got links bundles that are over you know terabits of size. So 10 gig of multicast is not a big deal. And the savings is not a big deal. Uh, and we have a lot of our infrastructure is uh, like dual you know, hub and spoke. So there's no benefit, right? Because it's going to go across all the links anyway. So we're, we're, we're taking a big hit you know, for running it. The other thing is V6 multicast is pretty, you know, I don't know anybody that's running you know, a large V6 multicast and a V4 and V6 at the same time, I think it's just nightmare. But we do have an edge of our infrastructure that's, you know, does have, you know, the DOCSIS infrastructure, the CMTS is our termination system. Um, that DOCSIS information is a, a, a subnet that has, you know, the capability of doing L2 multicast. Right? So we'd like to be able to take advantage of that function without turning it on to the rest of the infrastructure. So we're looking at, you know, right now we're going to be looking at putting this into the infrastructure trial this summer, where we can have a source generate, you know, instead of generating the multicast packet, it'll generate a SR packet, where it'll say, you know, I'm the source, wherever I am, X clone home one. You know, my destination is, you know, a multicast address, so the FF. Um, and then I'm going to put an SRH header on it that says basically go to, to one of these edge CMTSs, you know, uh, first. And then go multicast. So we'll send the packet unicast to each one of the CMTSs. Once the CMTS picks up that packet, it'll say, I've got another segment in the list. It happens to be this, you know, it's the final, right? It's the, the destination multicast. And then it'll generate as a multicast on the, on the L2 subnet. Right? 
So no WAN ran multicast, but we take advantage of it on a subnet, right? And you know, multicast is core to v6 on a subnet basis. So it's you know this is kind of na natural. So um, so we think there's a lot of promise in this. It sets up you know with the telemetry stuff, we get to learn a lot about the edge, um, you know where that information gets feed fed into these the source. It knows where everything is. It knows what people have joined what you know on MLD. And, uh, you know, it can manage how do we send the traffic to the edge of the infrastructure as a target of multicast. So. You're also going to say a lot of operationally multicast, even intra-domain multicast, is, it's operationally expensive because the troubleshooting process for it is backwards, right? Yeah, yeah, so reverse trees. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big operational win. I would say. Yeah. I mean, everybody, you know, hits something and then just, you know, prays until the tree rebuilds. So... And race conditions, so so all of a sudden you say, okay, that was interesting. All right, let's take another step. You say, well, what happens if I want to send a packet into you know kind of everybody's home, but I don't want the packet to be multicast because we got Wi-Fi, we got all these weird home environments. But I'd like to get a packet into everybody's home. So can I take that same mechanism and say, well, you know, I want to send an anycast packet you know to this eight colon colon one destination, <coughs> but what I'll do is I'll send it from source six colon colon one. But what I'll first do is I'll send it to the CMTS. You know, so I'll send it to my edge as a unicast. You know, this one is Y colon colon two. You know, uh, and then I'll send it as a multicast. So it'll replicate out. And then at the CPE in the person's home, it's got another hop. It'll say I'm joined that multicast. It'll pick it up and say, oh, there's one more thing, which is you know the final destination A colon colon one. So I'll take advantage of this spray function. You know, of the L2. You know, or of the V6 multicast capability of my edge, uh, and then at the final hop, you know that's all stripped off, and it turns into an anycast unicast packet within a you know like in a domain. So you can start using. It's kind of interesting because now I can start layering these techniques on, right? Okay. So here's another one that's kind of interesting that we're, we're playing around with, which is, you know, we've got these functions that we built up over time for things like GSLBs and load balancers and direct server return and how we do all this other stuff. And uh, we've tried to use Anycast, but Anycast has a lot of problems. It's very simple, very elegant, but, you know, one of the things is you go to an Anycast sort, um, somebody advertising an Anycast, and all of a sudden, you know, too many things join it. Well, that's a problem. It doesn't have any choice other than go down. Uh, or, you know, everybody joins it, and everything's fine, but the topology shifts, and then everybody scatters to, you know, other sources, you know, with or without problems. So can we take advantage of segment routing to say, well, can we leverage that with, you know, uh, uh, with any cast and see what we can build. So you can look at a, we're, we've got, you know, just kind of uh, uh, POC kind of style code for, for this stuff now, but where you've got a client, C colon colon one, he wants to make a connection, you know, to a service that's being advertised as, you know, any cast address, A colon colon one. So a bunch of servers all scattered out all over the network. He, you know, sends off a SYN packet, you know, sources C colon colon one, destinations A colon colon one, and he ends up hitting, you know, this Anycast server. And that Anycast server now, when he, you know, goes to reply back and sends his uh, SYN ACK, he can jam in an SRH header. And he can say, <coughs> you know, I'm A colon colon one, which you connected to. Your destination is you, C colon colon one. But my real address is R colon colon two. So at this point, you know, he sends that packet out. You know, it gets to the client, and the client can do a reverse. Right? So now he can flip that header. It was, you know, uh, it's only one, but if there was multiple, he could flip that, um, you know, SID list. Uh, but in this case, he just uses that and goes in the reverse direction. So now when he first originates the packet, the packet's destination, destinations are colon colon two. And then, you know, the next hop is the actual cast. So now you've pinned the connections into this. It's right? almost like a NAT. It's hey, kind of a weird kind of <laughs> yeah, kind of, but it's not really a net. It's very lispish. Yeah. Lispy. <laughs> it's lispy. So, but but now now if you get a, or now, it's now, really an alias. It's like it, it's a you know, yeah, okay, you know, locator server separation kind of thing, right? Yeah. So, but um, but at this point, night, right? If you get into this state, now you can. Uh, there's a topology shift, right? Everything is pinned to that R colon colon two physical address. Nothing moves. Great. Now, if he starts getting too many connections, right? 
He can do a local load balancing function, know that he's got too much stuff. He can just pull his 8 colon colon 1 address. And now everything still stays that's been pinned, but he doesn't get any new requests. And those, you know, hand, you know, are handled off. He can actually do, uh, you know, if you were running in a cloud environment, you could start spinning up, you know, more servers because you don't have enough load. You can spin them up in particular areas. They come up, you know, and then, you know, new people start joining that. You can actually go down a global load balancing function and kill connections that are kind of not at the best, the optimal server, you know, pinned to the optimal AnyCast server for their particular connection. Kill them and start auto scaling at a right. degree right now. Yeah. So, so it's kind of interesting. It's a very small, you know, look at the, you know, it's one SID and all of a sudden you can do some pretty interesting functions. So just to clarify that, I mean, that seems a lot like the model that, like, Providers use on the internet with any cast, right? With like HTTP, where they do a redirect, so yeah. an any cast VIP, and then they just send back the redirect to pin you to one location. Right. So it's the same thing, but you're doing it for any application. Any application. Yeah, it's very similar. I think a lot of these techniques start looking like CDN type techniques. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just it's not HTTP specific. Yeah. So I, I, I jumped this one in. You know, you gotta forgive me, forgive the, uh, you know, <laughs> my whatever. So this is an old question, right? What's the difference between a router and a server? And, uh, you know, we've, we've been kind of re-asking this question as we move into the NFE space, and cloud and software and what's what. So here's the best, you know, kind of uh, take I've got, you know, on it, and which is, you know, there's only like three things you can really do to data. It might be more, but three ones. So one is you can move data through space, and that's kind of what a router does. So it'll move at a distance. It'll move it somewhere. Right, you can move it through time, and that's what storage does. So, so that's great. Or you can transform it, and that's what Kubernetes does. Right. So if you looked at it, today's network, and you know modern networks, you know they really move data, you know, through time and space. You know, CDNs are a perfect example. If you look at a modern data center, it moves data through, you know, a transformation and store and, and time. Right. So that's the data center. So what we've been looking at is, can you build an infrastructure that does all three? So space, time, transformation, both three, and then you get the smarter network. You get the peacock. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's that. So, <clears throat> so I'll get I'll get on to my my last my last uh, you know use case and just kind of an interesting thing, which is if you look at what's happening, you know, it's been happening. You know, in the processor side of the world, you know, with 8-bit microcontrollers, I mean, we, we wrote everything as single-purpose programs, assembly language, blah, blah, blah. It was all, you know, networking is kind of weird. It's controller-based, 8-bit, you know, proprietary. Right? We kind of got into the 16-24-bit processor range. We started getting single-tasking OSs you know, that we all know and love. Then, uh, you know, the Internet kind of popped up with 34-bit address space. You know, then we really got into 32-bit multitasking, you know, OSs, you know, and uh, still kind of the V4 internet space and Linux and everything else started showing up. And we kind of hit the 64-bit space, you know, we started getting into now hypervisors and, you know, virtualization, you know, and we're starting on this 128-bit V6 internet space. And if you look at, like, you know, there were a whole bunch of reasons for these things to move in, in the different directions, but, you know, we're hitting this point where this 6,428-bit space is kind of interesting, right? So, you know, what's the drive to go to 128-bit, you know, compute core? You know, I would say, you know, if you, just running, you know, if you just had instructions that filled that 64-bit space, you know, it takes 57 years at 10 gigahertz and, you know, one cycle instructions to get through. It's a big space. You know, 64 bits is a big space. And it's kind of interesting, you know, now as we're starting to talk about multi-cores and microservices and V6 segment routing, you know, that we're lining up on this, you know, kind of 64-bit address space and 128-bit address space in the, you know, in the, uh, in the network space. Not sure 100% how that, you know, you know, will pan out, but it, it, it is a very interesting, you know, kind of flip. And the host size right, is obviously slash 64 in a, uh, in a, in a 128-bit address. So I'll jump to the last use case, and this is ones that are kind of interesting. We're kind of spending more of our time. Is a lot of times you talk about service chaining, and you talk about you know NFE functions, which you know basically don't do much, right? I mean, they're you know virtual CPEs, which basically pass packets, or you can go to a firewall, which basically passes packets or doesn't pass packets, or you can go to a you know you know nanny filters, or you know you, 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 they're very limited in what you can do. Right? You can get the list of 
you know, you really start to run into problems in like five NFV functions that are really network functions. So what happens if you took a look at a real service chain that did real work? Right, so I've got a, you know, something here where I've got a video source, say MPEG-2, 30 megabit stream coming out. Right? And it's coming out from a source vcon one right? It's going to a transcoder where it's going to take that stream in. It's going to you know, transcode the video to 8 megabit, sec 8 megabit per second MPEG-4. Right? Then it's going to output that stream to, say, a just-in-time packager, which is going to flip that into dash formats. You know, right? And it'll output it and put it on an origin. So it does real use cases. The bits change, you know, the packets change, um, you know, through the whole service chain. It's working at, you know, the data level, the application level. And I haven't even talked about the transport, but you know, just assume, you know, the transport can change even, you know, between that. So it's, it, but it's really interesting that, you know, I can code this as, you know, a segment routing header. So I can just say, you know, source when it outputs a packet, you know, it's coming from V colon colon one. Its destination is go to this origin. Right, O colon colon one, but go through the transcoder, T colon colon one first, and then go to the just in time package or J colon colon one, and then go to the origin. So all of a sudden, you know, you're actually kind of building the state for an application service chain in the packet itself. And, uh, you know, if the transcoder and the just in time packager right, are stateless, you know, they can actually provide their function without getting, you know, uh, you know configuration type information state put into them. And you can start flipping them around, right? You, if that transcoder doesn't exist, you can spin up a transcoder. You can spin it up in an optimal location in the network. You can have a backup transcoder and then, you know, T colon colon 2 and just flip the service flow over to it. You're going to keep the service chain. The other thing is you can start playing, you know, interesting games where I've got a problem. People watching the video, there's a problem with the video. So I can go back into this thing and modify the service chain and say, well, I'll take the video source B colon colon 1 and I want you to actually send it to a video quality monitoring system, you know, probe in the network. So, you know, put it in you know, colon colon 1, you know, video, you know, VQM, right? And then go to the transcoder. And then it comes out of there in, uh, in MPEG-4, send it to another video quality monitor, you know, colon colon 2. And then send it to the just-in-time packager and then maybe coming out of the just-in-time packager, send it off to Wireshark, W colon colon. So I can dynamically shift that service chain on the fly, you know, and add monitoring probes in the middle. It's very similar to how you would, you know, how you would troubleshoot a, you know, almost like troubleshooting a program. So, you know, the one thing, you know, so everybody kind of, I mean, gets that? That seems well, to make sense? It goes back to what we were talking about a bit ago, being able to correlate the, that data. Once you're getting that data, you can start adding um, intelligence mm -hmm. from your events that you're receiving and, and detecting on packets and video source and things like that and be able to rewrite and add <coughs> your, um, um, you know, your headers to send them different directions to get more data mm -hmm. and be able to make um, intelligent decisions based on that again. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's what but I'm it, getting out of this is that because I can start manipulating all this data and you're going back to, like you said, collecting all of that um, analytics. Right. You can start. And it's not just path, right? Right. It's, I mean, you're, you're getting back to, like you said, I might want to send it to a different transcoder. I might say I'm getting jitter from over here. I might want to encode it a different way, or I might want to go and spin something up at another destination to do right. something else. Right. And I mean, if you take a look at the path example, you could almost imagine that as a service chain of null function. Exactly. That do nothing. Right. Yeah. Until you tell it to. Right. Or, yeah. Or it just drags the traffic to right. the null function. So, yep. it, you know, so all of a sudden, thing, more and more things start looking like service chains, even if they're no kind of networking concept. And so, just to kind of take a last piece. It, you know, it's interesting because, you know, like, networking guys like to move data from point A to point B. It's just kind of in our nature. But if you ask, like, a software guy what we just did, and he would be, you know, probably more comfortable with something that looked like you know, this main, you know, code snippet, right, where, you know, I'm taking a video source, passing it into a transcode function, that output is put into a, a just-in-time package function, and oh, by the way, I'm assigning the result to, the order to something called CDN origin. So all of a sudden, now we've got two models for exactly the same thing that we're doing. One that's very focused on, you know, kind of moving data through space. The other one that's much more focused on moving data, you know, through compute, you know, kind of transform. And, and uh, so... You know, I, I think that's pretty interesting. I mean, we're also, you know, trying to, you know, um, 
proof of concept up some of these, but you can start looking at things like, you know, shell scripts where, you know, you've got, you know, cat FUD, you know, source, pipe it to transcode, pipe it to just in time packs. You know, those things can be modified, and we're looking at, you know, to actually do service chain functions where, you know, you know, the transcode package or any of these things don't need to run on that local box. So they're just dynamically linked. It starts looking like dynamic linking, right? I mean, you're just redirecting stuff based on right. state. But you're, you're almost treating the v6 address of that function, that microservice, as like the function pointer in a piece yeah. of code. Right? And you're linking, you know, <clears throat> this thing. So you get very close to OSI model of addressing and the way services live in an OSI network using V6. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's not, no, okay. it's not a bad thing. Okay. It's actually, I think it's a good thing. Okay. I don't, I actually haven't followed that, so. Well, you have followed it because it's. I'm stepping like, on it? <laughs> so many years old. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Everything. Right? It's just, you know, everything comes around again. Rule so, 11. Yeah. So, so anyway, I think this is, you know, this is some of the stuff that we're working on now. I mean, I think a lot of the things that we're doing today, you know, where we're, you know, talking about controllers and, you know, pushing some of the state and things. You can look at it this way, where you could actually compile, you know, something called main, you know, and as one of the function things are typecast, those things happen to be, you know, network libraries, you know, that are type, you know, that are type checked. And then when you run the program, it's dynamically linked, and that linking is actually the, you know, the, the you know the function call you know to this network function that lives inside the infrastructure and it's it's built dynamically. So um, you POC'd the service chaining? We've we've just done pieces of these. Okay. Yeah, so we're 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 getting like we're trying to build a toolbox of like you know here's a bunch of really interesting things and then as we get real world use cases we're you know you know. I was just curious if that was existing today in code or that's a roadmap in terms of the SR feature set on the platforms you're using. And a lot of this stuff lives in like software. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, so a lot of this, you know, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of these service chaining things, right. you know, start to look like, you know, the, the service chain is in the code, not in the hardware and the physical right. infrastructure. You're just using the hardware to. Right. But, but there's, right, exactly. Now, when you get into things like, you know, what's the SID length? to depth and, you know, of a transit node and stuff like that. That's, you know, I think, you know, there's the basic TE type of use cases. Right, right. There's also use cases where we might be te you know, in a service chain. And then you're going to get a mixed mode environment where you might have a large, you know, you know stack. So we're, we're kind of, we're looking at, I think there's ways around it, but we're looking at this. You know, <coughs> well. so. That's it. Very cool. So when you talk about service chaining, I mean, this came up earlier with policy-based routing, right? Like, to me as a network guy, that's usually a mechanism we use to get traffic where it shouldn't go, so to a security appliance or something, right? The guys want to do transparent redirection to do IPS, IDS, firewall, something, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem we always have with that, regardless of how you do it, service chaining or PBR or something, is how do we prove when stuff breaks that it's not the service chain or the PBR that's the problem, right? Because there's... You know, I'll agree with you that it's not cool, but it's required in some cases. And the problem with it is there's no way to validate that we're actually doing the PBR on most platforms. So with service chaining, I see the same problem, right? So, I mean, we get paged and they say, traffic's not getting there. Well, how do we validate through the service chain in this case that that traffic is, in fact, getting to their box and they're the ones dropping it for some reason? So, I mean, so the, I mean that's a big... Yeah. You know, all the, wherever you put the complications, how do you troubleshoot this out? I mean, there's a couple good things about V6SR, which is, you know, that SID list is there, you know, through all stages. So anytime you take a look at, you know, that, you know, packet, you will see where it's been and where it's going. So that's one of the nice features of the SR stuff, to, you know, start to do the troubleshooting. Uh, the other one is, I think, is the more we push the functionality up toward the application as opposed to something else that's doing the PBR rule, the easier this is going to be. So if the firewall you know, function, you know, or whatever the intrusion detection function was doing it, as opposed to it doing some kind of redirect that later another device did, you know, uh, like a PBR or, you know, some another redirection, then, you know, that'll be much easier to troubleshoot. And, and this mechanism is pretty simple. I mean, with V6 SR, it's just to add an extension header, right? So, especially for, you know, V6, if the traffic is V6 already, and you want to send it off to, you know, something to, like, clean the traffic, I mean, just stick the extension header in and send it off to the clean site. It's already got all the, you know, you haven't really modified the packet, you know. If you have multiples, you can dynamically change that. It could be an any cast function. So do you have a means, though, to actually 
see the frames on the wire to say, here's the SID list, I can validate that this is going where it should go? Because that's always the problem, right? Is like, how do we get the packets so, off the box? To yeah, so, so our mechanism, you know, is going to be, you know, just having, you know, like a Wireshark type probes in the infrastructure. Okay. And then we just add to the SID list, you know. Yeah. You know, go to the Wireshark <laughs> probe. Yeah. Do I see it? Yes. Okay, go to this other, you know, probe. It's still going to be, it's probably less so, but it's probably still going to fall under the same validation issues that you have with like a PBR. Like, for example, you got a box that you've, you've set up a PBR, but maybe that didn't get pushed down into the ASIC, and so it's not actually doing it even though the config says it is. Right, yeah. So you still have those same, you'll still run into those same problems, I think. They just won't, they won't be nearly as complicated, and you can also validate that yeah. stack. I mean, the destination of the packet will be wherever you're trying to send it. You know, so it's not like, with, with a PBR type of thing, it's like the source desk stays the same, but you're going to shift it onto another path. Here, you're changing the destination. Now, you're going to fix it by taking the next exit, you know, next uh, SID in the list, in the answer yeah. H list, so, and put it back. But, you know, I mean, that packet's going there. Or you're not falsely inserting yeah. a different next hop in there. Right. It's simply just, I'm going to shift this, yeah. this path, and it's, you know, yeah, it's just the, the more that like you talk about service chain, I mean, we've been talking about this for years now, and it's getting to the point where it's like, is this viable, or should we be looking at one of these inline tap solutions that is actually designed to do this? That I can pull the frames off, it can win this, and I just put it back on the network, right? I don't, I don't think they're one, really. Yeah. I mean, with, you know, if I put, I like those. Yeah, you know they're nice and they, they do what they say they're going to do. They're also you know a budget line item and they're expensive yeah. and they're a management issue sometimes. So you know you have to you can do this all within the networking team. I think that really the key is like you get, you get the people that need you, you create your use case, your needs and requirements, and then the people that implement that talk to each other. So kind of going along with what he's saying, um, being able to to identify. If, if you're doing service chaining, things like that, to know if it, if it hit this layer, went here, went there, is it as easy as just saying, at every level I'm going to add a tag, for example, that I can somehow pull into my analytics to be able to say, I know it hit here, I know it hit here, I know it hit here. But, I mean, so we're, you know, so if you get into one of those, anal I mean, you should be able to see any, any packet that gets processed right. in an SRH node and get a counter and okay. detail okay. information. There's one other thing that's kind of interesting is there's a, you know, there's a proposal for IOAM 6, right, which is an inline, ex using an extension header for actually, you know, validating the path right. and everything else. So I see that as a similar, as very complementary to this, right, so where you could actually jam in, uh, you know, an extension Sorry. header that says, hey, you know, f tell me the path. Right. It's in line with and my strip data. And strip it off when you're done. And strip it off when you're done. Without V6 and if your intermediary devices are stupid, let's just say a regular firewall, do you see this still being viable? Like in, in terms of service chaining, right? Because if we looked at, like, let's just say in a data center, we had, you know, two VLANs or whatever, two hosts that needed to go through a firewall to communicate. I don't see this being doable, I guess, today in, in V4 with, you know, a regular, just quotes, regular firewall because that firewall is going to get it and have no idea what's what's happening with all these tags and stuff. Well, so, you know, <clears throat> so you got to set the case up. But if it's, you know, if it's V4 traffic, trying to go to V4 traffic with the firewall in the middle. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think, um, you know, we've got to get that into V6. So that means we've got an in-cap step. You know, once it's in V6, we can add the extension header and say, go to the firewall. Um, if you look at the, some of the code, like, you know, in the VPP code in FDIO, you know, it can treat even an old application. It'll strip off the SRE header. Okay. If it... In the packet, so it looks just like you know a you know you, you can even strip off the v6 outer header. It'll look like a v4 application. Then when it's done and it sends it out, it'll add that cap and then add the SRH header on processed for the next step. So you can take you know I mean the best would be it'd be nice if the applications and the NFV functions were you know v6 SR aware, but if they're not, we can dummy it up and you know, stack them on as a microservice. Yeah, because there's going to be a, a huge gap from like normal people that aren't. Here, where you're talking about, right? Like, that's great, but how do we get from crappy apps? Right. So to that's why I think the FDIO stuff is so important, you know, because it's it's just like a perfect shim with a you know large amount of pretty you know good functionality in it and 
high performance where you can, you know, take an old app, run it on top, and then, you know, it can provide a lot of, you know, for now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. band-aid it. So one of the things I think you, I think you roundabout said this, and I've heard this before from um, a couple other large uh, networks, is that you're looking at these, so when you're evaluating something, your mindset is, this is a V6 network with legacy IPv4 support. Is that yes. accurate? That's right. accurate. Okay. I yeah. think that's so, important to say as many times as possible because you know a lot of folks aren't thinking about things that way, but that's really kind of the shift that needs to happen. I think, I think yeah. most of the providers, yeah. most of the transit and eyeball providers or content providers are thinking that way. I mean, I know we are, I know Comcast is, I know Level 3 is. I mean, this yeah. is just... The backbone stuff, I think, is and, and and it's nice that it's also the you know the consumer residential uh, services are right. also being deployed in that with that mindset. I think that the uh, you know where where the legacy V4 quote unquote is gonna you know really needs a push is you know within some of the more conservative uh, aspects of networking. But it's nice that. You know, you guys are thinking about it that way, and that you're pushing it out into residential services with people that don't know, don't care. Actually. Right, they don't care, right. but they're doing it. Yeah, right. and that's right. I think you know that's why one of the critical things is how do we do things that you know the customer does care about that will increase the performance now that we're on V6. So we're very focused on that side. I think just on the other piece, which is, you know, I mean, I think the you know V4 was a horrible space. Everybody, you know, toward the you know toward the end, I guess, from my from our point of view. But, you know, we had to do dual stack, so everybody did the dual stack, and now we're done. You know, I mean, I don't think people realize that, you know, that this is the worst state. Right? You got the V4 problems and the V6 problems all together, right? And so now, you know, really the end state to get you know, back to V4, or hopefully back to better than V4, is to get all the way to V4 only. And I think just, you know, sometimes, like, I think for us it's critical because we don't have an MPLS you know, underlay that we want to put in place. We use it some places, but we don't want that as our data plane. So that means we really do want a V6 only data plane. I think if you, you know, a lot of times some of the people look at it and say, well, you know, it's really not that much different V4, V6 because they got the under, you know, the MPLS underlay. Uh, but for us, we don't have that. So we got to get the move all the way to V6 only. 